Perfect. Hello, grade 10, and welcome to IT. So um, if you haven't joined us in the last couple of days, um, I'm Amy, I'm Amy now, and it's so good to have you. So at the moment, we're busy covering some theory work. I know it's not everyone's favorite, um, but it's quite funny. I actually enjoy a lot of the theory. I think it's really interesting, especially in grade 10. I think we learn so many um, new facts that it almost irons out these misconceptions that we live with every single day. Um, so basically, what I want to cover today is I want to finish output devices, just because yesterday at the end of the lesson, I felt like I was rushing, and I don't know if we got the full impact of that. I then want to look at storage devices and what makes up this case that we call this computer. Perfect. I didn't give you homework yesterday, so you should have been able to chill. Um, let's see how far we get today. If we don't get far enough, I might not give you homework again. Just depends on how much we cover. So, I, like I said, I just want to recap some of the output devices because I really think we were becoming a bit wishy-washy towards the end. Um, just some things I do want to bring your attention to is I discussed some of the characteristic of characteristics of monitors yesterday, but I thought maybe just to start today's lesson off, let's warm up, let's get into the swing of things. I'll speak about a few of the different characteristics that we didn't look at. So if we look at something um, called response time. So this is really, really, really important for people that are gamers. And the reason for that, <clears throat> sorry, is that it's measured in milliseconds. So this is the time it takes for it to change the color or the value of every pixel that makes up your screen. So a low response time is needed for high graphics, okay? I know that doesn't make sense or anything, but essentially what it actually means is the lower the response time is, the better the picture isn't going to blur. I know that makes no sense in your head, but I just thought that was a fun, interesting fact that we could look at. Another thing I thought we could look at is the contrast ratio. So this is the measurement of the blocks between the darkest black to the brightest white that the monitor can produce, okay? So the larger the ratio, the better. And for an example, we like to use a thousand to one. So those are just other aspects that we didn't look at yesterday that I thought would be quite fun if we looked at today. But I did say that I wanted to look at printers more today because we were rushing through this. But let's just quickly recap the difference between the three main types of printers. So the first one that we look at is the dark matrix printers, and they're probably the one of the older printers that we look at. And this uses old technology that works by striking pins onto the paper through these inked ribbons. And we mentioned this yesterday, an example of that would be the invoices that we get from companies that still use those printers. Then, if we think of an inkjet printer, this sprays dots of ink onto paper. So they run slower than laser printers, um, and they're more expensive to run, but they produce good quality images when they're printed. Um, and then we looked at laser printers, and we just said that this works by melting some sort of toner onto the paper. Uh, they're also really good quality printers um, because they print faster and they're sometimes cheaper to run. Most home printers would actually be a laser printer. But then let's look at something like your 3D printers. These are very new to the market and I don't think many people have actually interacted with these 3D printers. Uh, I, um, I have had quite a bit of interaction with them. So if you study at Tux, and you actually study teaching, they have really cool labs that have these 3D printers in for the purposes of studying. Um, and they're actually really cool to watch um, how the printer actually works. So basically, 3D printing is a process of making three-dimensional solid objects from a digital file. So you create this digital file on, the, on an app that runs off your computer, and that is then sent to the actual printer, okay? The creation of the 3D object is archived by laying different um, 
successive layers of material on top of each other. So say for instance, you wanted to build a block and say for instance, it was a square, let's say we want to build a cube and it's one centimeter by one centimeter. Um, basically it will print out the first layer of the first square and then it will print out the second layer of the second square. And basically it carries on doing that until your full 3D cube has been put together. Okay, so each of these layers can be seen, like I said, as thinly sliced horizontal cross sections. So it takes this 3D um, digital image that it's getting in, okay, and it's cutting it into the 2D shape that represents every layer of that 3D object. Okay, it's really cool. Um, nowadays, a lot of movie props are made with this. And some prosthetics that we get in operations use 3D printers now, so that we don't necessarily have to have metal um, prosthetics, we can have plastic prosthetics. So when evaluating these things called these printer things, that. sorry, when we're evaluating these things, it's also good to know what printers are good for, what things, why? Like I said yesterday, if you'd like to print a, a poster for school, it might be a different need to what I would need to be able to print a poster for some lecture that we're giving. Okay, so knowing what the different printers do and what their advantages and disadvantages are, so it will give you an idea of what um, place to look at if you want to go there. Okay, then there's also something else I want to bring your attention to. So factors when we're looking at printers are whether they're black and white in their color, how quickly they can print and how much it costs to print a page. But there are other um, factors to consider. So things like your dots per inch. So this is called the DPR. I'm sure you've heard of this. And essentially this measures how many dots a printer can print in one inch. So the higher this DPR is, the more detailed that printer is going to print. Then we get pages per minute, so the PPM. And this me measures how many pages of black text, plain black text, a printer can print in a minute. So the higher the pages per minute is, the faster that printer can print. Okay, perfect. So that's printers. Um, I'm glad we've just spent so five more extra minutes on that. I felt a bit rushed yesterday. Then we look in at data projectors. So a data projector connects to your computer and it projects what is on your monitor on a screen to a blank wall or a blank whiteboard, for an example, so that everyone can see almost what I'm seeing or project it into a bigger version of what would be on the screen in front of you. So the technology inside these different projectors, okay, so how that specific projector creates that image is different, okay? And because of that, we actually get different types of projectors. We can get a LCD projector, we can get an LED projector, and we even get something called a Pico, project, a Pico projector. And that's a baby low powered projector, probably about the size of a cell phone, that works only in a dark room. So nowadays, lots of teenagers have these things called Pico projectors, and they use it to pro project their games that they play on. So if you're an avid online gamer, rather than play on a smaller screen, they'll use the entire bedroom wall. Okay. Another thing is that the quality of projectors can be measured in these three main factors. So we speak about lumens, resolution, and contrast um, ratio. So lumens measures um, the brightness of the projector, okay? Resolution, this determines how many pixels can be displayed at a given point, whereas your contrast ratio measures, like we said, the difference between the darkest and the lightest parts of that image, okay? What the contrast of that is going to be. So the higher the contrast ratio, the better the quality of the picture. Cool. So let's look at speakers and headphones. And this is where I gave you a tiny bit of homework, nothing too hectic, 
okay? But I said to you that there are two things that um, is important when it comes to the quality of a sound that a computer is dependent on, okay? And I asked you to research what those two things were. So what are they? What, what determines the two things that um, influences the quality of the sound that the computer produces? Let's see. The sound card, 100%, and the speaker or headphone used. So now it's important to realize that different speakers and different headphones have different qualities. So the actual speaker and the actual headphone have different qualities uh, based on the sound that they give us. So basically, the more expensive that speaker or headphone is, okay, might be because that they're producing a better sound quality. Thank you, Poppy, for doing your homework. I really appreciate that, okay? Um, that's amazing. But then it's also then basically that professional equipment, okay, will produce sound of a better quality than the sound card built into the motherboard. Or let's say, for an example, a cheap pair of USB-powered speakers that we might get from a free sale or the headphones we get with our phones. We're not saying that they cheap because they don't work. They just of lesser quality than those we would use in a professional environment. Cool. Then we looked at the th then we were just going to chat about the three different types of headphones. So we get closed back headphones, in ear headphones, and Bluetooth. So closed back basically just creates an isolated audio experience so that you can only hear the sound you want to hear. And generally speaking, they're quite big because they fit over your whole ear, right? Then we get your in-ear headphones and most um, cell phones nowadays come with in-ear headphones. Um, they also have changed the way they look. Uh, our phone has very different in-ear headphones to let's say Samsung, okay? So these are known for the portability and convenience that they bring. Um, they go very little or they go little deep in your ear to provide comfort. And basically, if someone starts talking to you with these on, if they are loud enough, it almost gives you the same effect as your closed back earphones then or closed back headphones. Then we're talking about um, Bluetooth. And basically, that could be an in-ear or a closed back. It just connects without a cable. Cool. Then we get something called an input and an output device. So basically it's, cons it's playing the role of input and output at the same time, okay? So this is a device with any hardware used by me or any other system to communicate with the computer. Like we knew before, any input and output device communicates with the computer in some way but they are capable of sending information and retrieving information the same way, okay? And the best type of example of this is your interactive whiteboards. And this is basically just a board that combines the technologies of a computer. So let's say for an example, it could be like, for instance, a touchscreen, it could be a projector, or it could be a whiteboard. And all those three aspects bring either an input or an output, okay? And you can connect this interactive whiteboard to one or many laptops, tablets, your PCs, or any other type of electronic device that you can think of, okay? And then when we're in a classroom environment, they give the learners and teachers the opportunity to interact more than you would be able to on a normal whiteboard. Okay, so that's just quickly, I thought let's quickly finish output devices. We'll chat about that for, for a little bit. But now let's look at storage devices. Okay, this is something new. So storage devices serve basically the general purpose and that is to store data. But they differ in some senses. So they differ with regards to the capacity of how much information or data that they can store, let's say if they're portable or not, 
the speed at which it takes to retrieve that information or data once we want to access it, and the different ways that this storage device is built. Because we spoke about um, hard disk drives and SSDs, and we also realized that dependence on how they are made, so they bring different characteristics to the party. Okay. But when we evaluate these storage devices, there are certain things that we have to take into consideration. So that's like, let's say, function. So function basically determines which type of device is going to be best suited for whatever function you want to perform right now. So like the other day, we spoke about the difference between an SSD and an HDD. And a, a, and we wanted to decide which one was better. And essentially, we came to the conclusion that although maybe an SSD may run faster, it is more expensive than a hard disk drive. So we just want to, we just want to make use of whichever storage device is best suited for my current situation. Then we talk about the storage capabilities. And this determines how much information you can save on that device. Let's say for an example, you purely just want to have something to transfer from one laptop to another. Do you have to spend thousands of rands on a portable hard drive? Not necessarily. You could just spend, let's say, 100 rand and transfer those, um, those files between two devices on a flash drive. Then we look at something called your portability. And that obviously just determines how easily we can carry these things around and move from one computer to another. Then we talk about the use, and that is basically determined by what storage device would most likely be used for that situation. Like I, just, like I explained, use um, goes hand in hand with function. Cool. And then we talk about something called reliability, okay? And that basically just determines how reliable this device is going to be to be um, in, in terms of whether it's going to break down or not. So let me give you an example. Let's say for an example, nowadays, we can get quite uh, big flash drives. Let's say the same size as a portable hard drive. The problem comes in sometimes with the portable hard drive is that because of the capabilities that they have, if it's bumped, the main components of that hard drive are so, um, so sensitive to movement that sometimes they can split apart. That is why often, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, it's happened to me more times than I want to actually admit, okay? But how many times have you bumped a hard drive or you've dropped it on the floor and all of a sudden when you plug it in, um, it stops working? It doesn't read your files anymore. It happens to you at the worst time. And basically what has happened is those components that are built together have probably come apart. And that is why you can't use them. So my suggestion will be dependent on the amount of size that you have, sometimes using a flash drive is actually easier than what it would be to use a portable hard drive. But obviously, if you want something with one terabyte of space versus let's say 500 gigs, you just have to weigh up the pros and cons. Cool. So let's actually look at the storage devices that we get. So examples of some of these storage devices, we get, um, we get different storage devices that are st st installed inside the case, okay? And these are optical drives. So optical drives are your things like your CD, your DVD, or your Blu-ray. And they are designed for portability in mind. And then you're probably going to say, mm, but how? Think about it. If you think of a CD, okay, it's one solid piece. I 100% agree, we can damage that piece that it is constructed of, but essentially it's of one part, okay? So when these drives were um, built, they were designed for portability, okay? You can write to these disks, remove it, 
go and then insert it in any other computer that obviously has the same compatibility with regards to that drive. For an example, not many laptops nowadays are built with CD or DVD drives. My laptop doesn't have one, which is quite annoying sometimes because lots of textbooks come with the resources on a CD. Then I'm like, how do I get those? It's not very helpful. Okay, so when I made the choice to have a laptop without a CD or DVD drive, I don't know if it was my finest hour. Cool. But then we get something called optical storage. And this is a little bit slower and has less capacity, okay, and is more expensive, let's say, compared to your magnetic, your magnetic storage or even your SSD. So these discs are easily damaged, like I said, because if you scratch them or even if you leave them in the heat, okay, they can easily be damaged. So we essentially then just say, nowadays the trend for more suitable portable storage would then be your flash drives or your portable hard drives. Cool. Then we speak about something called your hard disk drive and your solid state drive. And I'm not really going to spend too much time on this because I have spent time on this before. But the one thing I do want to bring your attention to is a hard disk drive is something that we call secondary storage device, okay? And that is just because its main function is to store data permanently by controlling the position, reading and writing onto the hard disk, okay? So that was the one thing I just wanted to say about that. Then we looked at the solid state drives and it's just a type of storage device that does not have any parts. Um, it also produces less heat, so it increases the lifespan of this storage device. Um, but I'm not gonna speak too much more about that because we have spoken about it before. So let's look at something called a portable hard drive. So they're a lot easier to move around um, compared to your fixed hard drives. However, Thanks to USB connectors, we can quickly be connected to different computers, okay? And this is ideal for transferring large amounts of data or backing up the data that is stored on the computer at the moment, okay? Although, like I said, they are very sensitive to rough handling. Then, as you can see in front of you, we get something called a hybrid storage device, okay? Let's check what this is. So this is just a device, it's a storage device that combines a hard disk drive, I'm sure you guessed it, a hard disk drive and your solid state drive. By doing this, the hybrid storage device can take the advantage of the storage capabilities of your hard disk drive but the speed of your solid state drive. So this works by storing commonly used files on higher speeds. So let's say for an example, you have something like your operating system. You have files for your operating system that you probably use more often than something else. So we then store operating systems files on your solid state drive. Okay, whereas if you have um, bigger files, so let's say if you have lots of movies that you want all the time, um, that you watch all the time, that will be stored on your hard disk drive. So it doesn't take up too much space. Quite cool. Okay, then we looked at, then we've spoken about flash drives and memory cards. Cool, but let's now move on because I think most storage devices work in the same way. They're just made up of different things. Let's actually spend some time now discussing this case that we talk about all the time, the actual computer that we're talking about. Okay, cool. So there's a new word or potentially not a new word, okay, that's sitting on the screens in front of us. And that is that it says that computers have modular design. 
okay? So basically it means that computers are assembled from a variety of parts, which makes maintenance and upgrading easier than if they were made from one piece. So I always like to throw out the question, why would computer manufacturers do this? Because doesn't it make more sense that you'd have to buy a new computer every single time individual parts broke? They would make more money. Like to me, why would you want to have them made up of different parts or assembled differently? Let's see if anyone can guess. Ooh, challenging questions for a Wednesday. Come on, guys, you got this. Tell me, why do you think someone would prefer, or the computer manufacturers would prefer to have individual parts rather than one piece? Okay, let's think about this. If it costs, it's easier to replace 100%. So it's easier for me as the user to replace things and upgrade. It makes the computer more customizable. Okay, so you guys are touching on such great points. So essentially it comes down to computer manufacturers do not want to spend 500 hours. Okay, I mean, I'm very exaggerating here, but they would rather spend five minutes making 10 parts, then spend five hours on making one part. Okay, so if you, if you take in the time it takes to make a computer, the time it takes to make the different variety of parts, if you make parts, okay, that are replaceable, you can have these parts um, bettered in the long run. So then they can sell these individual parts for more than what it actually costs them to make one computer. Okay, so I don't know if any of you build computers, um, but it, it's actually quite interesting. Sometimes people are always saying, oh, it's actually cheaper to buy a laptop than it would be to build a computer from scratch. But a lot of gamers believe that building a computer based on your gaming style, okay, is worth it in the end. So it's all based on your own opinion, okay? But essentially, we can't change the fact that it's made from a variety of different parts, okay? Because I'm not sure if all of us, I know I can't speak, I know I can speak for this, but I couldn't make a computer of just one part, okay? I would have to make it of a variety of different parts. Cool. But let's talk about these parts then that make up this modular design that I'm talking about. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about is this thing called your motherboard. So this is a motherboard in front of you. I got this picture from the free textbook of Siabula. It's in your chapter, okay? And it's such a nice textbook because all those different parts are different colors. So it's easily visible to see what the different parts are. But let's check what a motherboard is and what it does. So this is a computer's large printed circuit board, okay? And it physically connects all the different components. So on a motherboard, there are specific um, positions for the CPU, the GPU, and the RAM, okay? And where they situate is actually based on what the process, the, what the, um, what that component does. So let's say for an example, where the RAM sits near the CPU, whatever the CPU actually does, okay, what its main task is, if it relates to another component, we like to build them closer together. Okay, so that's what I mean by that. There's also specific connectors that allow you to connect to the power supply to the computer. And finally, the motherboard has several ports that allow you to plug in devices. We know that. We're talking about things called your USB ports. What would we use to connect to a USB port? 
what device could we use to connect to a USB port? Think about an input or an output device. A flash drive, 100%. We connect a storage device, okay, a mouse. So now we've got an input device and we have a storage device. Can you see how we actually then have ports that use different types of devices, but for one port? Okay, cool. But believe it or not, there are three main functions of this motherboard. And essentially the functions are that they have to provide a place for other devices to be connected. So let's say for instance, like your memory or your graphics card, okay? Then another function of the motherboard is that it must distribute the power evenly between the components. But if a component needs more power than another component, it splits it based on the processing capacity that it needs, okay? And it acts as a communication hub. As the components send and receive this information on the motherboard, um, it happens through those little circuits that we can see on the picture. So you'll learn about this next year, so don't stress too much about the capacity of the motherboard. But what I just want to explain to you is that all those little um, lines that connect these components, they basically, they basically like roads and it sends information and it retrieves, but some are only one ways. So it can only send or can only retrieve. And there are reasons for that, okay? This is so interesting, guys. It's mind blowing stuff here. Okay, cool. Then what are we gonna look at next? Next, I wanna just speak about the processing devices. So we've spoken about these processing devices before. We spoke about our CPU and our GPU. But all I wanna bring, what I wanna emphasize with regards to our CPU is that it's located inside the computer case. We obviously know that, and it's located on the motherboard. And this is the part of the computer that is responsible for receiving and carrying out the computer instructions. So each CPU can be made up of multiple cores. Like I said, don't stress too much if um, you don't understand the integral um, ideas of all of this. You obviously just need to know the basics for now. You look at this more detail in grade 11. So you just need to know that it's made up of multiple cores, okay? And it's independent processing units can complete tasks on their own, okay? So let's say for an example, we get something called multi-threading and multi-processing. Don't stress about that too much. These are just words that you need to start familiarizing yourselves with, okay? But essentially, by adding or multiplying these cores to the CPU, the processing power available to the computer increases dramatically, okay? And with little heat gain. So just, just know that there are these things and as we um, increase these things, so it benefits the CPU, okay? But we also need to know that the CPU contains a control unit. Obviously it's called a the CPU and we know that it controls something. So obviously we knew that it was going to have some control unit, okay? But this unit then coordinates all the activities the CPU and the LAU do together, okay? So basically the ALU is your arithmetic logical unit and this is where the logical operators and arithmetic calculations are carried out. So just know that this, the control unit coordinates all the activity in the CPU and the ALU, okay? So your arithmetic logic unit is where all the logical operators and arithmetic calculations are carried out, okay? Then if we look at our GPU, this is basically just used, it's responsible for creating and doing calculations needed to display the images on your screen. Okay, so that's all of that. Um, I need to start wrap, wrapping up soon because we're presenting 
um, I have to wrap up five minutes earlier because we, we're presenting at VITS at four. So I just want to touch on memory and storage, and then we're going to look at the homework just for five minutes. Okay. Base, what are the two words when we talk about memory and storage? What are the two words that define the major difference between memory and storage? Anyone, someone? We talk about two words when we refer to memory and when we refer to storage. What are those words, grade 10? Okay, RAM, 100%. We'd speak about RAM in terms of memory. Perfect, okay. We talk about ROM, okay. ROM is also memory. Perfect, okay. But when I talk about the two words we refer to, I'm actually talking about the words such as temporary and permanent. Those are the two crucial words when we compare memory and storage. Memory being temporary and storage being permanent. Okay, 100%. Volatile. Memory is volatile. Look at you guys go. Okay, cool. So that was just what I wanted to reiterate with memory and storage. So let's just check now. Okay, this is different ports. I will cover the ports tomorrow. Don't stress too much on that. But let's quickly look at the so for the homework, I want you to go to our theory textbook like normal, and I want us to do activity 3.4. Four. Okay, we're going to look at activity 3.4, please, and I will go through the answers with you tomorrow. But just a heads up, I promised you, okay, that I wasn't going to do um, theory all week. So tomorrow, I will quickly wrap up ports. We will look at a smartphone versus a computer, but I want to touch on trace tables and your RPO model so that on Friday, we can spend those full 45 minutes going through different examples of what you could possibly get. Okay, so I'm just gonna tell you that again, this is the, oh, sorry. This is the homework, okay, it's activity 3.4. Question number one is a match the columns, it should be quick. Question number two is a true and false. So you just, like we said before, if it's true, leave it. Else if it's false, we must correct the bolded word. Then I wanna know for question four, okay, which of these devices, if it's an input, output, or if it would be a processing device. And then there's three little questions, okay? Three little questions that um, I want to just look at. And the reason I want to look at these three quick questions is because these are questions that you're going to get in a test type of example. This is the type of question we look at with regards to how are they going to ask me about these inputs and output devices. Okay, thank you so much for the amazing lesson grade 10. I know it was a lot of information today. I'm sorry. Okay, but I will see you same place, same time tomorrow. Have an amazing afternoon.